pleasure to it's a great pleasure to welcome you all in. I normally start, you know, all of the introductions up here by saying the same thing, which is could you please take this uh, your version of this out and turn it off for the next few hours? It makes it a little easier in a small room. Of course, it would be it would be I, I suppose timely to say that in an, in a seminar on in, in a one-day symposium on architectural machines, this particular machine and turning it off has a kind of contradiction, I think, to a lot of the material you'll be seeing today. But um, uh, it's great to welcome everybody in for this. I think it's, gonna, it's a great lineup of people that we have today. Today's event has been organized by Claudia Pesquero in uh, A Intermediate Unit 10 and Marie-Ange Brier from the FRAC Center in Orléans yeah, in France uh, for a one-day symposium that is titled Architectural... Uh, machines, I think a topic that interests many people in a place like this in many different ways. <coughs> um, the event is very much inspired, in fact, by uh, a fantastic uh, exhibition that was up over the autumn. For those of you that haven't seen the catalog yet, I know we have them upstairs and we have them down in the shop. An absolutely great show that Marie-Ange organized in Sevilla last autumn, which brought together uh, uh, an incredible international survey of avant-garde artists, architects, and designers exploring the limits today of, uh, of new technology, architectural space, interactivity, and the realities surrounding um, intelligence in, uh, in physical space in the world today. Uh, absolutely great show, incredible survey, and a beautiful catalog that summarizes some of the research by uh, a huge group of people that are at the absolute cutting edge today of, of digital and computational technologies in art and architecture. It features many people you all will know who happen to work, teach, and I think even to an extent study here uh, at the A, but also a great group of other people that came in for that show. That's been really the inspiration for today's symposium, which will bring together presentations, I think a series of eight presentations and a roundtable discussion at 4 o'clock at the end of the day, which will try and tease out some of the things that are discovered and explored in the various pieces of work. Um, I think we all know that we are at the far end of about a 15-year period that began in the mid-90s with the arrival of new forms of computation uh, and information processing in the discipline of architecture especially. Um, it's a cycle that's gone in many unexpected directions and in fact doesn't often very much resemble what things looked like not so long ago. The little phone that I asked you to turn off a moment ago was a good deal more powerful today than our entire bank of computers and a little program we set up here called the DRL way back when uh, in 1995, which I always like to remind people is the last year in which Microsoft releases an operating system deliberately designed to not connect two computers together a little system called Windows 95, which couldn't talk reliably between two computers. I mean, phenomenally, only 15 years ago. <coughs> um, 1995 is also the year in which uh, Tim Berners-Lee releases a protocol that becomes something called the World Wide Web, and computational and information processing takes on a suddenly very different life not so long ago. And I think as we all started that conversation around computational and digital technologies in places like this in the 1990s, we all tended to think in terms of hardware, software, um, and stuff you could see or work with in some direct form. Of course, what took off very quickly is a kind of machine built around networks that's much more intangible and flexible than these kind of old-fashioned electrical or mechanical definitions of technology. And I think the ways in which networks have grown and proliferated is, of course, a kind of theme that will run through an awfully lot of the work uh, that you'll be seeing today. I, um, I'd just like to thank Claudia and Marie-Ange for organizing the event, which is absolutely great. All of our presenters who are in today, all of you for coming, please dip in and out during the day. I think it's deliberately designed like a kind of Philip Glass opera, which means over five or six hours come in, in and out of the room as you can. But come in really at the end of the day at 4 o'clock for what I know will be a nice discussion around some of the issues that are being brought up today. Push people in that discussion with your own questions and comments. I think we are at an incredibly interesting moment in the evolution of networks and not just digital technologies in which a lot of the assumptions we've been working with, which have made sense for a few years, are now, now being challenged by new realities, and particularly the miniaturization of those networks into things as big as a mobile phone 
Um, and we want to encourage all of you to really join us in that debate. What we're trying to do is push this conversation to a next level, and I know it's going to be a great day for helping us do that. So I'm going to turn over to Marie-Ange or Claudia to yeah. introduce. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Is it Claudia? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brett, uh, for, the, for the introduction, uh, and um, thanks for everybody for uh, coming. Um, I just would like to introduce the various, uh, yeah, it's a bit tall for me, but I could not, yeah. <laughs> it's going to work for Marianne as well, I suppose. <laughs> so I just want to introduce the various speakers. Uh, today we are going to discuss the relationship between science and architecture that was inspired by the team of the universe, as Brett said, and we have different kind of approach from more critical one to more technological one, from digital exploration to physical test. And in particular, the first speaker is Marianne, that was the curator of the, um, of the, universe, uh, the architectural section of universe at the BIAX. Uh, Marianne, since 1966, uh, has been the director of the Central Regional Contemporary Art Collection, FRAC Center in Orléans where the collection is channeled toward the linkage between art and research in architecture. In 1999, Marianne was co-founder of the Orléans International Architectural uh, Conference, ArchiLab, which brings together younger international practitioners involved in the latest form of architecture. Marianne is currently working in a PhD at the EHESS in Paris, uh, retra retracing the legal status of the architectural model by way of history or representation, and she has been the curator of the architectural uh, section of Universe in Seville. Uh, therefore, Marianne will mainly talk of uh, the, the, t the title of her speech is Architecture After Architecture to Our Machine Environments. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Brett, for the invitation and uh, for this invitation of the AA and Claudia, who organized everything. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, sorry for my English, uh, as you can hear, I am French. <laughs> and um, so this, um, my, my talk will deal with the exhibition universe and uh, the, the, the general curator was uh, Peter Weibel. Uh, you know surely Peter Weibel, he's the director of the ZKM in Karlsruhe. And uh, ZKM in is in fact a center dedicated to media uh, technology uh, in art, but also in architecture. And, um, and so I, I curate the architectural section, media architecture. And uh, my, um, the proposal was linked to the, um, the idea of Peter Weibel universe, uh, how we connect now the individual with the the globality of the world, uh, which kind of connection, which kind of interfaces uh, uh, exist now between uh, uh, the individual and, uh, the, uh, for instance, the global network. And uh, for Peter Weibel, architecture has a really uh, uh, a big importance in uh, this new relationship between microsystem systems today and um, also a city which is not uh, uh, just physical activities, but of course virtual activities. And at the starting point uh, of that exhibition, so you will have uh, around 150 artists and uh, 40 architects. And so the idea, maybe uh, one important artist uh, at that time was Constant. Uh, you know all of us, Constant Nieuwenhuis, uh, because in 58, uh, he designed a new concept of planetary village, uh, New Babylon. And uh, New Babylon was um, the first atmospheric machine, uh, so the, the term is uh, invented, designed by, uh, by uh, Constant. And, um, and this atmospheric machine means that uh, architecture does not exist anymore uh, as a shape, as a form, uh, and architect also doesn't exist. Uh, so we, we have this uh, idea of a disappearance of uh, architecture already at that time. And so in that exhibition, you will find some issues uh, dealing with, uh, uh, I would say, the notion of form, uh, the notion of, uh, uh, of nature, uh, what does mean uh, nature today. And uh, you will um, find also an evolution of the notion of interactivity, responsiveness, uh, from the 90s uh, uh, up to now. And uh, what means, of course, performative architecture, and in which sense uh, architects are dealing with the concept of uh, performance, uh, performative architecture. And so I start with the, with the pictures. 
And um, what was also um, a part, a uh, very uh, conceptual part of that exhibition is to, uh, to have uh, historical works of the, of the 60s, radical works, of course, you know, Archigram and uh, Instant City. Uh, I will go back. Yeah. And uh, because uh, to me, uh, this, uh, this project is in the, the FRA collection in 69, uh, uh, Instant City was the first also uh, uh, disappearance of architecture because we just have now an event. The architecture is not anymore shaped uh, and uh, it's just a device. Uh, and uh, you don't really inhabit uh, the city, but you are a kind of user. You will use a stream of information uh, and uh, you won't inhabit uh, a, def a defined space. Uh. And this idea of um, artificial environment uh, was of course also present, you know, at that time, uh, you have all this movement called radical architecture that you know, of course, uh, and uh, on the right you see uh, Archizum, um, Archizum Associatis, the same period, of course, and you, you recognize uh, No Stop City. And um, in No Stop City, you can see the, this model that you know, it's very, very famous. Uh, you have also the disappearance of architecture. We ha you have a city wi without architecture, without any kind of object. And uh, Andrea Branzi was talking about uh, an utopia of quantity and not anymore an utopia of quality. And this idea of an artificial environment, again, uh, architecture as a machine uh, that you will use, uh, and uh, you are on the same level uh, that, uh, that architecture, you, you will find this concept very present at that day. I will quote very quickly André Branzi because you know that uh, André Branzi is still working now on the concept of uh, a light uh, architecture. André Branzi wrote, uh, today the urban condition is made up of services, information, technologies, network, environmental practice, practices, microclimates. Uh, they are contained within architecture but cannot be represented by architecture's figurative codes. And so you don't have any more uh, any kind of representation of architecture, but a new way of really activating uh, the device. And it's a work, uh, I think that uh, this architect will give a lecture at the AA, uh, 09 Amid. Uh, they, they design an immaterial museum, and uh, it's again the same idea of, uh, of a network. Network society, or work as a network, because you, you will uh, have a, a patch that you will put on your skin, and then uh, the information will be connected uh, through a, a mobile, uh, your mobile phone, and you, you will virtually uh, visit all the museum exhibits. And so, of course, the, the museum doesn't exist anymore. Architecture is just uh, informative. And of course, it's uh, between a conceptual, artistic work uh, that uh, the design. Today, I won't show, of course, uh, all the exhibition because as I told you, there are more than uh, 40 architects. So it will be really a, a very quick look. And so about this punctuation of historical works, uh, you, you, you had this uh, first uh, uh, room dealing with network, society, disappearance of the object, the building, and another room uh, connected to the idea of, um, uh, of course, you recognize Villa Rosa, the, the bubbles of um, this, um, the, uh, this prototype. And as you know, it was not only a drawing uh, model, but really an, um, a prototype because uh, uh, all the people uh, uh, use uh, this device. Uh, Kofi Mulbrow realized in 68 uh, at uh, the real scale uh, this, uh, this bubble with PVC bubbles. Uh, and the idea is that uh, architecture became a cognitive field. And again, uh, you have this, uh, uh, this idea of envelope, this appearance of the limit uh, between the body and uh, the environment. You, you, you could be in, in direct connection. And you will find also the, the helmets uh, that uh, people are working as an extension of the brain. Uh, and helmets were also something very recurrent at that time. You find it in uh, the Autrician architecture and uh, again uh, in other architects at that time. And so the architecture is again uh, this artificial environment and again this atmospheric machine device uh, that uh, you will use. Uh, you want in a bit, you want to uh, uh, have a representation of something, but uh, you will be in the real time and real use uh, of it. 
to some other drawings. And uh, I put also these drawings because maybe we are in London, <laughs> as you know, Renner Banham, and uh, François d'Allegret, the, the famous illustration of uh, Home is Not a House. Uh, and um, at that time, it was um, 60, uh, 65. Uh, it was very important in the definition of the environment. And I think that most of you uh, uh, students uh, uh, used to, to, to read uh, the, the, uh, yes, the, the text of Renard Madame and uh, this idea of the environmental technology, which is still uh, up to now uh, very, very important. Uh, and in this drawing, you have uh, uh, all many of the concepts that Renard Madame will develop uh, through this uh, technological kit, uh, the envelope, uh, the relationship between organic and techniques uh, and uh, this uh, this kind of uh, interaction and uh, that he will develop in uh, his uh, all his direct course and so we had a quick look uh, about the idea of network uh, disappearance after I would say uh, envelope bubbles <coughs> within <coughs> interaction of a device uh, and uh, another part was more linked um, on the idea the concept of the importance of biology uh, in architecture. And of course, we cannot do it without uh, the me Japanese uh, metabolist. And uh, it's the model of the Toshiba Pavilion uh, in 70 and in Osaka. And so it was built. Uh, and uh, you know, of course, Japanese metabolism, uh, Whiskey Shokurakawa. And they, they, they really uh, push the, the concept that uh, with the D DNA uh, elix, uh, which became the metaphorical structure for the structural system of, uh, of for the structural urban system. And uh, with the self-generation of the spiral or the, the geometrical form that uh, they develop. And the idea for Kurakawa is that the, the city was a kind of living organism. And another concept, uh, because it was at that time uh, very important, was um, the concept of interaction, interactive architecture. And uh, now, uh, I think that uh, architects today are not inter interpreting the, this idea of interactivity in the same way. Here you have recognized uh, Toyurito, Tower of Winds. Um, and uh, the Tower of Winds uh, uh, was built, uh, as you know, in Osaka in 86. Uh, and uh, maybe it was uh, the, the, the very first uh, interactive architecture dealing with air, weather conditions, and uh, everything was changing, and the architecture was this kind of de dematerialized envelope, uh, and uh, including and interacting with uh, all the environmental parameters. And uh, so it's why this historically the, this building uh, is, uh, is important. And uh, for Toyurito, there is a close uh, relationship between new technology and nature. It's looking at, uh, at nature, something uh, uh, very important as a tool uh, to go beyond uh, also uh, architecture. And in the same uh, stream of uh, interactive architecture, <coughs> Now, uh, I think it's, uh, but you will see uh, other examples later, but of course the fresh pavilion of Knox, uh, uh, Lars Freibrook, was also among the first in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, you, you found in the all the, 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 cr the uh, critical text, the idea of liquidity, of information, and also the idea of a really physical interaction with the building. And for Knox, Lars Freibrook, um, they took inspiration in uh, Claude Parent Paul Virillo, uh, you know the oblique function, where you have this idea of a special instability, uh, where the body will be uh, solicited by uh, a kind of disturbance, uh, and you will use uh, the gravitational uh, weight of the body. You will really physically interact with, uh, with architecture and be included in a very immersive uh, special in experience. Uh, through the concept of uh, liquidity in architecture and then uh, the, the building of uh, Lars Freibrook. Uh, another one was built uh, by Osterhuis. Uh, and uh, Osterhuis, Cass Osterhuis, is uh, also talking today uh, about not um, uh, an adaptive architecture, but he's, he's talking about a proactive architecture. And he, he was writing that now uh, architecture has to offer new configuration in real time. And um, now it's a kind of uh, historical monster, this kind of, spro of project in the early 90s. But I think uh, th 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 they are still important. 
Um, here you have that uh, you have uh, Tom Wiscomb. Uh, you you cannot see very clearly, but uh, I think that you you know the the uh, the, the approach of Tom Wiscomb emergent uh, uh, because he, he used the term of bioconstructivism uh, that uh, that Lev Mertens uh, introduced. And uh, Tom Wiscomb is dealing with the, the concept of, of biology in uh, maybe in a more analogical way because it's talking that. Um, biology, mathematics, um, engineering uh, will combine uh, uh, and could be inspired by natural forms uh, such as swarms, hives, uh, uh, dragonfly, uh, wings, bat wings, radiolaire, uh, and so on. And then you can have a, a new structural system uh, completely inspired directly uh, from nature. And we can imagine a transfer of technology between life forms and synthetic biology. And so he's advocating for this uh, strong connection between genetic engineering and also synthetic biology in his approach uh, to create bioartificial spaces. Another architect uh, uh, which is uh, living, who is living in Los Angeles is uh, Xavier Rotar, Caroline Diaz Alonso. And uh, I think now there is uh, uh, many, uh, many students uh, inspired by the uh, the approach of uh, Xavier Oterk. And uh, in the work of uh, Xavier Oterk, uh, in fact, it, it, could, it can seem organic, but um, he has a, a very uh, specific approach uh, because it's a kind of maximalist approach. Uh, and uh, the idea is to uh, really to, um, to have a kind of mix between subject and object, between also the inside and the outside. Uh, you don't have any more uh, reference to the body. You cannot in that in that identify a kind of human reference. Uh, and uh, in the project of Xavier Rotark, he really wants to go beyond this anthropological <coughs> reference to the, to the human, which is still uh, very important in architecture. And maybe it is in this sense that uh, we have to, to look at this kind of phylogenetic, uh, uh, processual uh, uh, machine of Xavier Rotark, uh, of uh, Alonso, Hernan Diaz Alonso. Of course, you know uh, the French architect Francois Roche. Uh, um, uh, in, in France, he remains uh, something, somebody important uh, for th this kind of research. And uh, it's interesting because Francois Roche was uh, one of the first in the very early 90s to, to call, to, to talk about hyperlocalism. And uh, the concept of uh, hyperlocalism is still very important today. And he really developed it 20 most, uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, here it's a more recent project, the city uh, Relief in Bangkok. Uh, but uh, in the early 90s, Francois Roche was talking about the idea of entropy. So hyperlocalism, architecture, which is uh, in direct connection with contextual, territorial par parameters. Uh, and uh, of course, there is no an addition of some, uh, something else, uh, but uh, the, the architecture really 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 deal uh, with the with the entro entropy uh, of the environment and uh, for the dust uh, the dust uh, relief project in bangkok uh, you have this kind of uh, electrify mesh uh, who will absorb uh, all the dust of bangkok and uh, so the pollution will be absorbing and so at the end uh, architecture as an object will completely disappear and uh, you have nothing that you can anymore recognize and uh, of course, it's a conceptual, uh, conceptual approach. Um, and Francois Roche is talking about corrupted biotopes. Uh, and he's trying to continue to, to develop uh, this kind of topics, uh, talking about uh, uh, fiction architecture of science, science fiction architecture. And for him, the concept of complexity has really to deal uh, uh, with this entropic, uh, entropic situation, disturbances of identity, hybridization between the project and the territory. And uh, it's uh, something which is really at uh, the core of uh, all uh, his, uh, his work. Another architect that, uh, that you know, Vicente Gualart, uh, uh, he's uh, also dealing with a school in, uh, in Barcelona, the YAC. And uh, Vicente Gualart, um, 
developer. Uh, and um, to me, it's also important because it, it was also one of the first, again in the early 90s, uh, to develop the, the idea of uh, architecture as a core nature. And uh, to deal with the idea of uh, a re close relationship between uh, digital architecture and nature. And uh, you have a project uh, on this kind of mountain, it was for a competition in, uh, in Poland. And uh, the digital nature of architecture was, uh, has been advocating by uh, Vicente Gualarta. And so you can have um, here uh, the idea of a to topographical, topological space uh, and uh, this uh, complete uh, mix between uh, artificial and nature. Another project you, you can see a little bit better, I chose, um, it's the um, uh, H House by uh, Jacob McFarlane. Uh, they are the architect of the new building uh, for the FRAC, uh, and uh, they designed this house uh, a few years ago. And um, it is a completely digital skin of the mountain. And uh, you don't have, uh, it's completely underground, as you can see, uh, you don't have any more doors, um, uh, windows and so on. But this activation again of a device, uh, uh, because architecture is just this uh, topographical landscape, uh, uh, machinic landscape, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, other project from uh, Morales Quiles in Sevilla. It was for a public plaza. And here, another <coughs> project by Philippe Ram, uh, another French, uh, Swiss, and, uh, and French. Uh, and um, Philippe Ram uh, has been developing since 15 years also the idea of a physiological architecture. And uh, so it's uh, um, uh, he's uh, taking into account uh, the chemical uh, constitution of the air, uh, everything which is uh, infra infra visible, in fact, in uh, his. Uh, is for in, in his architecture. And he defined architecture as a super nature climate. And uh, everything will deal with the weather conditions, uh, with the climate, uh, and, um, and with the idea that uh, he will create an informational atmosphere. And so uh, here you have Les Maisons Mollier, Mollier House, uh, inspired by uh, the famous diagram uh, designed by uh, the scientific scientist Mollier. And uh, you have a connection between wet and dry, hot and cold uh, in this uh, housing project. And uh, Philippe Ram was talking about uh, an indoor meteorology. The idea of meteorology is uh, a concept uh, uh, very important uh, for, for him. Uh, in another part of the um, of the exhibition, we had this, uh, so uh, some photos of uh, Gianni Petena in the 60s. Uh, he, uh, um, he designed this performance happening in uh, uh, 71, maybe in Minneapolis in the States. And um, the students of the, the university were wearing, wearing chairs, and so the work is uh, called uh, wearable chairs. And uh, again, uh, you don't have uh, a design object. It doesn't exist uh, uh, if you don't have the user, which will use, uh, uh, of course, uh, the chair. And you have uh, this, uh, this idea of uh, territor territorial design, uh, of uh, using something uh, which is uh, related to the action and not uh, to, to the, the, the object uh, as itself. And um, I, I, I won't talk uh, a lot about uh, is Philippe Aurel. Philippe Aurel is here. And uh, I think that uh, he will talk better than me uh, on uh, this, uh, his, uh, his project. But uh, I wanted just to introduce uh, a few, a few concepts, uh, a few no notions, in fact, uh, uh, dealing with the, the project of um, Philippe Aurel, Easy City, uh, or Axel Kilian, uh, who is also in that uh, exhibition. Uh, with uh, object uh, object design, uh, and uh, because uh, especially uh, Philippe Morel uh, talk about uh, a new use of uh, the, the idea of nature, and um, he was uh, talking about a computing ecology and uh, a digital ecosystem uh, for architecture, 
And I will quote, quote uh, uh, Frédéric Mingueru, uh, just a short sentence. Uh, he defined the computing space uh, as something embr embracing now uh, economy, politics, uh, uh, industry, and in general, all the generation of knowledge. And uh, I will quote also very briefly Carl Schuh, because uh, Carl Schuh uh, also um, defined in a very exact way uh, this new idea of architecture. And uh, he wrote for the first time, humankind is in, in, is in possession of the power to change and to transform the genetic constitution of biological, spaces, of biological species. And uh, manipulation of the genetic code, uh, uh, research of the genome, and Karshaw is talking about a post-human area today. And uh, with a bio-machinic mutation of species. And uh, this biogenetic revolution you will find uh, also later in the, the presentation, I think, of Stefano Mirti, with the work that uh, he did with uh, um, Elio Cacavale, uh, because you, you will have also the, this idea of a new frontier of science between genetic engineering and uh, the, the, the approach, uh, which is also, uh, which is now completely different. And Neri Hoffman, I think that Neri Hoffman was a former student of the AA. And um, it's uh, interesting because we are not talking about um, uh, beauty, for instance, or stylistic um, arguments uh, to, uh, about the work. Uh, we are really beyond stylistic, beyond the, the concept of beauty, uh, beyond the concept of analogy also in the relationship to, in the relationship to nature. Uh, in such works, uh, um, she try uh, to, uh, to transfer, to express uh, the forces, natural forces of uh, butterfly, uh, butterfly wings. And so it's the result, and you have uh, two models, two different models, which are this uh, kind of uh, uh, expression. And Neri Oxman is talking about a new materialism. Uh, dealing with the notion of a new dynamic potential materiality of the of the work, and uh, here you you we are really faced again with a, a completely new way of looking at the notion of design and object. And uh, Ocean with Michael Hansen, who was uh, also a former teacher at DAA. And um, it's another way uh, to look at uh, the notion of science. Uh, because Michael Ansel, Akim Mengas are talking, as you know, about morphoecology. And uh, architecture is uh, something kind of threshold uh, between the individual and the environment. Uh, of course, Renner Banham is uh, very important also for these, uh, these architects. And uh, this uh, dynamic uh, relationship to the environment uh, and, uh, again, uh, the contextual parameters is something at the basis of, uh, of uh, the work. And some architects can have a look at uh, architecture and science, maybe in a more posit positivist uh, way, approach, uh, dealing with the, the concept of innovation, technical innovation new techniques, uh, new materials. And uh, you have here Claude Nine. Uh, I think that you will also give a lecture or did it, also did it already in at DA. And uh, Claude Nine and Henri Prisgelis, uh, the building is under construction now in uh, Barcelona. It is called me Mediatic Building. And uh, it's using new, uh, the ETFE uh, technology with the air uh, field cushions and creating this kind of vertical cloud uh, because he wants to have also a dematerialization of the envelope uh, of architecture. And uh, Henri Crisgeli built another house that you know in, uh, in Spain. Uh, and he's really advocating also for a new approach of uh, uh, a performative architecture in that way uh, for him. And with the idea that uh, architecture will interact uh, uh, with all the energy conditions uh, and uh, of course the material conditions. And then uh, it's uh, at the crossroads of uh, all these material uh, parameters. 
And so usually, uh, just to, you know, for the, the exhibition, <coughs> there are projection of um, numero uh, uh, digital files so, um, uh, uh, to have, uh, I would say, a relationship between the scale of the model, the scale of the, the animation, and uh, sometimes a prototype or real object. Here you have the jellyfish because it was the direct ins inspiration uh, for uh, Henrik Rizgeli for this building. We don't see, yes, here it was another project by um, Colmac. And Colmac in the Inversa brain uh, also designed this kind of living facade, uh, living membrane. And uh, so everything is uh, uh, using the, the air, the light as uh, components of architecture. And uh, the architecture will adapt uh, itself to these uh, external par parameters. And uh, you will have m the concept of membrane and infrastructure at uh <coughs> the beginning of the project uh, to, to have a look at architecture as a living environment. Uh, Stefano Mirti will show later the, his project uh, just to, to end in a general way with, a materia, uh, with Ecologic Studio because they, they designed this prototype in the exhibition and maybe we can summarize uh, uh, some, uh, some ideas uh, that uh, I was just uh, talking about. Uh, about the idea also uh, of uh, ecology and uh, the idea of, of course, how to go from micro to macro, how to go from nanotechnology also to urban system. is something which is very important uh, today for architects. And uh, a lot of architects uh, are talking uh, and, uh, about uh, this machinic uh, dimension about architecture, which is a kind of uh, hybrid. And uh, for instance, for uh, Ecologic Studio, they, they think, uh, I was talking about the hyperlocalism of Francois Roche, and they are talking of uh, the architectural machine as an agent of local interaction. And I think that this idea of locality, of local interaction, is something very important is in this uh, uh, dimension of uh, an artificial system. And uh, also Servo uh, uh, and uh, Ulrika will talk about the SPORE project uh, who was in the which was in the exhibition and some others. Uh, there was the idea that architecture, in fact, is the infrastructure of components uh, that react to atmospheric conditions. And uh, you have in this work in Forg from Servo, for, uh, for instance, this idea of a mutual exchange. And Carlo Ratti will talk about also this idea of an augmented environment. Uh, and so this uh, augmented environment, to quote uh, Carlo, environment, environmental system, uh, is uh, very interesting. And uh, objective is talking also about an uh, architecture as an associative platform between the creator, designer, and the user. And architecture is just the medium. Thank you very much.
Sei pronta? Sì. Massa o meno? To go. You're ready? Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Marie We we now start with the uh, with the designer that are uh, of uh, Unifers. We we have um, Stefano Mirti. Stefano is a partner in ID Lab and director of Naba Design School in uh, Milan. He will present uh, Animal Farm that he's been developing for uh, Universe together with Elio Caccavale that is not <coughs> here today. Uh, he will start from Animal Farm uh, and then uh, he will introduce the concept of multiverse that uh, as far as I could check in multimedia has something to do with parallel universe, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Stefano will tell better. Okay, thanks. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting. Uh, I, uh, I'm here to explain what we did with Elio Caccavale in uh, Sevilla. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, a little thought, like when I, I was asked from uh, Claudia uh, to come here, uh, like we received the first invite to go to Sevilla was more or less one year ago. It was uh, pretty much now. In this year, everything changed. Like last year was like February uh, 2008. We get an invite. There is a Sevilla Biennale. Uh, there is a curator. There is a budget. There is a well. Everything is normal. Then we do our thing. <laughs> we go to Sevilla. There is the opening, uh, and the world runs smooth. By the opening, the the war was still run smoothly. It was a September. Then all of a sudden, the war collapsed, and. Uh <laughs> And uh, by the time the Biennale was uh, closed, uh, everything was completely changed. And this, I was talking with Carlo uh, at breakfast, is truly fascinating. So if the existing world implode, if you are a designer, that's a very good condition. Well, it would be actually best if we didn't have to pay the bills at the end of the month, that would be really the best. Still, we are in a time of an enormous shift. We are into the shift. Uh, we do feel this in the professional life that uh, we get into this uh, very curious condition that people ask us to do things we've never done before while no one asks us anymore to do the things we used to do. And, uh, uh, and furthermore, I'm, uh, we are here in a school and most of the people who are talking here today are teachers or students. So there is even more uh, compelling theme is uh, uh, if you are uh, dealing with uh, knowledge transfer or a school, uh, what do we teach? What do we learn? What are we like the normal system is that uh, uh, older people, they do teach what they know and younger people do get this uh, knowledge to be used later on in life. All of a sudden, it seems that uh, this, uh, we can say, social contract is broken, doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's like, uh, uh, well, in this extent, I'm lucky because I'm in charge of the design school in Milan and the Italian Milanese paradigm has been already broken since some years. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> on uh, uh, when we have the first year students, the first uh, explanation is you came here because you dream to become like Ron Rad, you, you dream to become like Sozzas and Castiglioni. Well, the dream, at least in Italy, is over. There's a next, <laughs> the Brianza is dead, and uh, there is no chance that uh, we will have any new furniture. Uh, so, this was already clear to us. Still, it, 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 it increased the magnitude that the uh, is quite impressive. Furthermore, and this was the little chit chat we have with uh, Marianne, nowadays we are in a, in a moment that uh, everything seems could be possible. If tomorrow I go to the office and I say to the people I work with, listen, I thought deeply, let's buy some land and we build our farmhouse and we live like in a geodesic uh, thing as a commune, people would uh, say, well, let's, let's think about, well, it can't be worse than it is now. So we are in a moment that all kind of Normally, as <laughs> the <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it looks funny, but it's horribly true. Like uh, most of us, uh, most of us in this room, we, we, never, uh, we never 
lived in a different world. Uh, we always been living in this, uh, well, what Guy Debord would define a society of spectacle. That's 24 hour show. Money comes, we don't know where, but it comes all the time. And it is great. And then all of a sudden, this is, uh, is no more true. Uh, we this it happened already several times, also in, uh, in the recent history. I'm Italian, so like in the mid 40s, and uh, like there were all these uh, architects that were doing great things with the fashion, with Mussolini, they were building cities that should last 1,000 years. And in a few months, boom, everything is gone, everything is destroyed, and you have to completely to reorganize your agenda. So, uh, mm, well, if I, I will talk briefly about what we did in Sevilla. We received the invitation. Uh, Marianne invited us, I think, because of our passion for inflatable structures and uh, other curious uh, things. <laughs> Elio Caccavale, who's uh, not here today, was invited because of his uh, work about biotechnologies. Uh, Elio uh, is a young researcher. He um, did get his uh, degree at the Royal College. And he's all uh, into these things about when you transplant uh, pig's uh, part into human being and what kind of thing does this imply for the place, the world where we live and so on. Uh, we actually did, uh, uh, when we received the list, there was our name, there was Elio, it was quite uh, easy to uh, call each other. Also, it's very curious to be here because uh, the only other time we collaborated with Elio was at uh, <laughs> a summer unit here at AA. It was like three, four years ago. It was the team was the London Zoo. And we were actually forecasting some kind of credit crunch. So the brief for the students was, Imagine that there is a financial uh, crisis and the zoo cannot, uh, cannot run anymore. So the animals, they must find part-time jobs to sustain themselves. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you, la you laugh. <laughs> you laugh. So uh, the students uh, uh, had to, okay, if the animal have to uh, uh, sustain themselves, they, uh, they will have to invent some uh, side jobs, and then students had to design all the machine tools and things that would actually be needed for such a thing. Anyway, that was uh, quite fun, and uh, we both enjoy very much. I will show you just one quick thing about uh, the inflatable things that uh, we like to do. Uh, the all this, uh, well, inflatable are nice because no one has invented anything. Whatever you could imagine to Whatever you could do with inflatable, someone already did before than you. So it's <laughs> you don't have this obsession to be the first uh, who does <laughs> things. This, uh, like, uh, we use them various times. This was the last year at Triennale in Milan, was this exhibition, La Casa per Tutti, a house for everyone. And uh, so apart from the, the inflatable structure, that time we prototype and uh, built also the inflatable furnitures. And uh, inflatables are great because they're very cheap to do, uh, very easy. And uh, here is a little video that ex shows. because they're very cheap to be done. It's very uh, easy to make mistakes, fix, adjust, uh, and they're a great platform to be developing all kinds of things. So um, having to imagine to go to Sevilla, the first idea was to do something on inflatable. Elio was still is into uh, this uh, uh, bio-based uh, uh, experience and researches. So finally, what we, uh, we found the mid-ground uh, to uh, make this project together was called the Animal Farm. Farm is P H R R M. Uh, simply, well, the, the basically the visitor would arrive to the to the exhibition hall. Uh, there was this uh, big table. 
the table was a uh, mocking up a possible master plan for a future uh, town, for a future city, where people uh, will live uh, uh, in a different way, uh, with uh, okay, inflatable structures and so on, and where uh, biotechnologies uh, are uh, the everyday uh, use. So around, that around the, the visitor, there were all the keywords about uh, this uh, new universe. We actually did want also to have some interactive uh, uh, interactivity into the system, but then we didn't want to, well, there was no purpose of showing the interaction per se. So we just used the interaction to serve Azure's purposes. So basically, uh, people would arrive. Uh, on the uh, table, there were some areas that were, uh, were instructions. Uh, some of the things were sensible. So like there was instruction was saying something like take the little uh, character, the green character, and put it on the, on the red uh, area. As soon as people uh, uh, would put the character on the given spot, a video, there were like 15 characters for 15 videos. Uh, all the video were coming from uh, YouTube or existing things. We, we didn't produce anything new. So, and each uh, little characters was a uh, well was tag. It was a uh, basically an RFID tag uh, system under the table. So each character was uh, bridging uh, people to one of the various uh, facets of the biotechnology and uh, contemporary life world. Uh, mm, also interesting to mention that uh, all the things you see here were done in rapid prototyping. So there is a little company in Torino that uh, we would give them uh, some very simple and rough file and they would uh, make and uh, do the whole. And finally, there were also some other sensible areas where you place in your hand, you would get some uh, uh, special, uh, some further content uh, based on sound. So finally, it was this curious mix between, uh, so the it looked like a very uh, uh, joyful and childish. Actually, all the video were indeed rather spooky there were all these stories about uh, uh, these uh, cows that are uh, I don't know exactly I, I'm not an expert on the field but then uh, all these <laughs> incredible things that you do to get uh, better milk better meat a big uh, tomato and growing this and uh, doing that then also the system was thought uh, to be used for uh, schools and uh, so that the teacher could come and of course on this biotechnology neither Ed or us have any specific ideas <coughs> just what we meant to do was something that uh, uh, people could think and could discuss uh, between themselves and if it was a school with a teacher and so on. So there was a video about the glowing fish. Like uh, already now we could buy uh, golden fish that glows. There is a company in Korea. Uh, they simply trans moved some parts of the DNA of a glowing uh, plant into the fish. So then of course the question is, but if you are able to do this on fish, can we do this on human? Uh, yes, most likely yes, but someone is doing, uh, we don't know, but probably someone is doing. <laughs> is this the world we live in? Yes, it is. Do we like? Yep. There are it's up to all of us. And uh, so this is uh, the, uh, what the work in Sevilla. But then, as uh, Claudia was saying, I also put together a very little uh, presentation. It deals about people who would invent their own new, well, the, the title of uh, the Sevilla thing was uh, Universe. So uh, in this extent, uh, uh, each of the projects that uh, Marianne was presenting were designer who would define a new universe, a new paradigm, a new model. And uh, of course, we all know about Archizoom and Archigram and Metabolist and so on. Actually, it is really fascinating because if you look through history, this has been always there in each age, in each period, in each place, there were people that would try to invent uh, other, uh, other universes. That in some, ex in some cases, then they would become the mainstream universe. For we start from the prehistorical people. This is, uh, I think, is one of the first known maps in Balcamonica. There are a couple of images that are uh, uh, wrong, like this one. Or like Hadrianus, uh, vi the Villa Adrianus in uh, nearby Rome. Uh, is another great example. He, he was old and he, he would build this enormous villa and each part of the villa, well, when I say villa is wrong, but each part of this enormous compound would refer to uh, some of the places he uh, had been there as emperor or general. Uh, the astronomical sundial uh, of Michelangelo, there is this uh, ex the one he did in Santa Maria degli Angeli in Rome. So basically is to transform a church into uh, an object 
uh, the major time. So when we think about interactive architecture, we generally assume it's a blink blink. <laughs> yes, uh, in some extent it's true, but uh, without blink blink, uh, other people before us, they made incredible things. So just to say, a window is an incredible device in terms of interactive architecture. It uh, allows us to get in touch with the weather, uh, the condition, the light, and so on. And the sundial, like in several churches you have sundials. They are incredibly fascinating. They tell you an enormous amount of things just through a little hole. Uh, then, of course, in terms of uh, inventing a new universe, uh, Federico da Montefeltro is one of many. He was a, a duke of a little uh, state, the Urbino state, and he's the one that is famous uh, that together with Laurana, who was one of his architects, uh, I, 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 was, I was trying to find the picture, but I couldn't find Anyway, so there is the, the city wall, and then the duke say, why don't we open a window to the landscape? Well, why don't we open the window to the outside? And then the architects say, well, why should we do? We're in open piazza, so we open a window from a, <laughs> a void to a void. And then they will say, yes, but then we frame what we see outside. Through this framing, they invented the concept of the landscape. So the thing was always there. Then someone say, why don't we frame it? And why don't we make it special? And uh, by the way, this is the same kind of uh, uh, conceptual uh, strategy that all were this I am particularly fond of all these people that they would make their own Wunderkammer. There are a series of them. Some of the most famous are the one in Copenhagen. The Wunderkammer is just people like us, that they would uh, <laughs> collect their uh, strange uh, things. Uh, they would design their own universe and they would share their own universe with other people. This uh, uh, it's another uh, mesmerizing example, is the Capucin uh, Cemetery in Palermo. In uh, about uh, in the 16th century, uh, the monks they thought that they could uh, we, we could bury people in a different way than we do normally. So uh, when the, there is a dead body, uh, it's placed in a special uh, room. Uh, it stays there for some weeks until only the skeleton remains. When you have the skeleton, you dress the skeleton with the clothes that the person was uh, wearing when he uh, was alive, and then you show them. So if you go to Palermo in the Cappuccini Church. There is the crypt, it's, it's incredibly big, and what is uh, really <laughs> spooky and fascinating at the same time, that uh, the bodies, or well the skeletons, are ordered by a job. So you have the militars, the lawyers, the young ladies, old ladies, and there is this uh, incredible, uh, also in Mexico and uh, in some other Catholic uh, countries you find this uh, thing. Again, this is a, a more specific, is a how do we reinvent or how we invent the cemetery thing. But then again, it's really impressive to see how the in, diff in how many different ways people could reinvent everything from nothing. Here is a probably the most uh, famous Wunderkammer system is in Rome, is uh, done by this Athanasius Kircher. There is one in Oxford by Ashmole. And uh, hope here is a uh, the Camera Obscura in San Vitale. Camera Obscura is there is in Fontanellato in between Parma and Bologna. There is this uh, beautiful castle. There are all the rooms, and then there is uh, the last room. There is a little you enter. It's dark. There is a little hole, and basically you have the movie of uh, what's outside. There is a mirror. Uh, you sit on the table. There is another image later on. And again, like I was explaining before, I was saying before about the Duke of Montefeltro and his architects that they invent. They say, why don't we frame it? this and we call it landscape, inventing the landscape, that was basically the same uh, idea that uh, Thera and Breton uh, did uh, in this uh, excursion uh, uh, saint julien de fauve They say, okay, we organize, next Sunday we organize a visit to this place. Why should we go there? Because there is nothing special. And uh, what do you mean because there's nothing special? Yes, it will become special because we go there. And this was one of several uh, incredibly nice and uh, fascinating Dada activities. The Merth Bow. The images have, have been ordered by chronological, so like we are uh, from uh, far away in, uh, in time, we are getting closer to us. Then uh, Schwitter and Merth Bow um, is getting closer to us. And also, eventually, you, you could understand what I mean. Like, Kircher, he does his own. Uh, um, his own museum, his own thing, in a very similar way. The Schwitter does a Merzbau, and in a very similar way, the people like uh, Claudia and Marco, ourselves, or <laughs> Carlo, or other people here, 
Each of us is busy trying to invent, give shape uh, to uh, a possible uh, different world. Like the useless machine by Bruno Munari from, well, he, he, he did this from 30s until uh, 70s and later. Uh, Duchamp, well, probably in this, uh, in this uh, pantheon of people who would uh, reinvent a uh, new universe, uh, probably Duchamp is the most uh, important. Uh, all the 20th century and as far as we know the 21st uh, in some way or others finally goes all the way to, to him. Uh, the Boite Invalide, the museum in the box is one of the several uh, uh, projects that uh, he did. Uh, here was, this is another example of uh, uh, Camera Obscura, this is in San Francisco. So basically it's very simple uh, functioning, there is a big room, there is a hole there is a mirror, and then th in this case, the San Francisco uh, hole is uh, pointing the, the sky. Well, so you see the, the change of, uh, basically the clouds gives you an incredibly nice abstract uh, motion. Yeah, again, uh, we saw Schwitter Merkbau, we saw Athanasio Stirkner, here is the Corbusier Cabanon. That is another great example of uh, uh, shaping uh, a possible different universe. And also it's very fascinating that all these examples, they don't imply uh, billion uh, pounds or euro or uh, dollar. They are all things that uh, each of us could do. It's just really a matter of uh, uh, what we like, what we are interested in, what kind of search, what kind of uh, experience are we looking for. Mm. I'm not really so knowledgeable about music, but some little things I know. And so we know that uh, uh, there are people that are, to some extent, they cross uh, their path with uh, architecture and design. John Cage is one of them. Uh, again, he's a, he's a more traditional uh, example. Is Carlo Scarpa in Palermo, the Abatellis uh, Museum, where all these things was basically was to define some area with color or material with stripes to give uh, uh, depth and tension to the objects in display. Here is another uh, of those people that uh, we could consider master, is Asger Jorn. This is a special map he did on Copenhagen, the thing that Copenhagen, the board, and it's what we know. Again, Bruno Munari, this is uh, another project of his. These are the sculptures you, ta you can take when you travel. So basically they're folded things and when you go to another town, you're in a hotel, you can have your own sculptures following you. Robert Smithson uh, is uh, another uh, person we, to some extent, we cannot skip. We cannot, uh, uh, apart from the very famous spiral, he did quite several uh, mapping exercises. And sometimes his mapping exercises were done with himself making maps or like this and the one before, or this with the uh, mirrors. But uh, some other time, his maps would, would take the shape of a um, uh, photo montage or uh, things that uh, from time to time would become a script, all kind of different medium. The time capsules uh, as a concept has been around quite a long time. There was, uh, I was reading uh, yesterday on the newspaper that uh, in Paris, uh, uh, in 1907, uh, at the Opera, they buried uh, a big box with uh, 24 records uh, of the best and the finest music of the period. So they put the, the, the records, they put the, the gramophone, and there was this thing that people could open that thing only one century later. So like they did last year or two years ago, and now they're ready to uh, have the CD with all the Caruso and all the by then. So time capsule is another great exercise. And it can be, uh, of course, if, uh, upon different fields, upon different uh, passion and uh, interest, you can take uh, different shapes. I'm sure also in architecture it will be interesting. And then we're getting closer to us. This is uh, quite, uh, uh, well, we all got very excited when uh, Dilor and Scofidio did their thing in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, Eat did the same thing, probably even better, 30 years before in uh, Osaka for the, was the warfare, was this was the Pepsi-Cola pavilion. 
the maps by, of course, art and contemporary art provide us an endless amount of, uh, well, basically art is, uh, uh, the artist is a person who's able constantly to reinvent and to define a uh, new universe in his own mind. This was a, a famous work by Boetti. Uh, this was done in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, this was, uh, we what we could say now, this is a generative piece of art. So Boetti would, uh, he told the women uh, embroidering the, this enormous carpet that the rule is very simple. You uh, draw the map of the world, each country has the flag uh, of its own, and whenever there is a revolution or a war or something that in the world map changes, you can make a new map. So, and then also this is very curious. So basically it's endless work because uh, you can keep doing this forever. And we're always able to uh, date uh, uh, more or less precisely the carpet we're talking about. Like this carpet must be before 1989 because the Soviet Union is still there and so on. Uh, Sotsas, uh, uh, that was also previously mentioned, uh, is another person that uh, through all his life he always crossed the uh, traditional professional activities with most experimental things. So in the 1972 and 73, he spent quite a long time uh, in the Spanish uh, South of Spain deserts, and he would make all these uh, uh, installation by himself with his uh, girlfriend. Uh, and he finally, all, all of these were called design metaphors. This, for instance, was the floor uh, where our step would be very uncertain. This was the door to enter the shadow. This, uh, uh, the title of this one was something like, uh, do you prefer to sit under the sun or do you prefer the shade? Uh, do you prefer to uh, look at the wall or do you prefer to look at the landscape? So these are just few. The whole book is pretty beautiful and there were like uh, uh, quite a wide range of all these uh, conceptual, uh, well, design metaphors. Again, we were talking about uh, before about this some uh, well, in some extent, this passion and uh, curiosity about generative uh, art. Brian Eno, that uh, very often he does cross uh, design uh, world. Uh, he did this uh, card deck. Well, I think that uh, it there are around several edition. Uh, it's called the Oblique Strategy Card Deck, and supposedly this help you or help us when we want to design and we are a little bit stuck or we want to try, we want to uh, refine our uh, design. And I think that uh, there is even a version for the iPhone, so and you can choose which deck you prefer. Of course, movies is another uh, incredible source of, uh, uh, of uh, inspiration. Uh, one of the most uh, relevant example from this point of view is Stalker movie. So it was uh, 1979, so it was way before Chernobyl. Uh, and Andrei Tarkovsky uh, came up with this movie. <coughs> the, the story is uh, there is a something happened in a, in a Russian uh, city. And no one knows what happened. No one cannot, you can't enter. It's forbidden. It's in it could be like a meteorite or uh, aliens or uh, something. So it, you cannot go there. It's very dangerous. Only few people, they would smuggle you in if you pay them, and the stalkers. And uh, because there is this rumor that if you get into this journey through the zone, trying to reach the inner part of the zone, uh, finally you reach a room in a building where all your uh, desire will be satisfied. And so the movie is a story about these uh, three characters, uh, the professor, the scientist, and the stalker himself, they get into this. Uh, it's amazing. It's one of the most incredible uh, ever made science fiction movie uh, done in a setting that is, uh, uh, it could be uh, any uh, city in Europe or in the world. This is another uh, example that is quite striking, is uh, the Museum of Jurassic Technologies in Los Angeles. Uh, don't be misled by the name or by the title. Uh, so the Museum of Jurassic Technology is a place, we go there, we enter, and it is a museum. There are displays, there are the room, there are, uh, then after a while you understand that everything you see, it's fake. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, each room, uh, it is perfect, 
you have uh, things, stories, uh, elements uh, found all over the world, but they are all fake. And again, also the relationship between real and fake, that uh, this is one of the most, uh, like if you are in Los Angeles, it's one of the most interesting museums. So finally, uh, this David Wilson is an art, well, he's not a, he looks, I it is like, it is an artist, a conceptual artist, and his work of art is the museum itself. Like uh, that you organize the institution that runs for 20 years, probably more. Each year you add new parts, and it looks uh, real, but it's not. Uh, I did, there is not in the presentation, another great example of this kind of uh, line of thought is uh, Orson Welles' F for Fake. It's one of his latest, uh, last movies from the 70s. It's all about the relation uh, with, uh, the between real and fake. Here was an example uh, in London, the pharmacy. Uh, of course, with the same spirit, you can also do organize uh, uh, exhibitions, books, and so on. Anne Sobris, that uh, is based in London, uh, the Do It project was very nice. He asked, uh, I think, like 500 different people, artists, designer, architect, to uh, give the instruction uh, to make your own things. So I don't buy a piece by the famous XYZ. I can get the instruction written by him or her on in order how I can make uh, the fanciful uh, art piece by myself. This is a great example. And uh, this finally is a, uh, we're getting close to us. This is a a war by Ilya Kabakov, the man who never threw anything away. Uh, so, well, the, the installation is like in this uh, museum in Oslo. It looks like his house, the house of this uh, man. And the whole the house is, uh, of course, if you never threw anything away, uh, you have a lot of things to collect and uh, show. There are other uh, ways we're getting closer to us, the method cars by the O. There are some uh, example. Uh, Raphael Lozano Hammer, uh, this is one of his uh, several always perfect, always beautiful works. Christian Muller is another one who is uh, quite good at inventing new uh, world and universes. This was uh, an installation in Graz. Uh, each pole, uh, basically the installation is like a radio. Uh, they map all the radio you could uh, hear in Graz and when you touch uh, each pole, you can hear a specific uh, sound, uh, well, one station. So basically moving around, you can get a, a sound uh, map of uh, all the possible uh, radios in uh, that place in Austria. The Pandora or the genome things, I guess you know. And uh, well, there are, if you get into the interactive things, there are examples are several, you would uh, clearly get lost. This was one by Dimita Zero. And finally, well, this is the last uh, image. It's okay, the, the, the final quote is rather silly and obvious. The road not only takes you to places, they are themselves places. Still, as silly, as obvious as it is, finally it's true that all uh, our effort in order to invent new universes, I don't have the feeling that uh, should be linked to the actual fact that, uh, like the fact that uh, all the people that uh, Marianne uh, uh, show was, show was showing us, Finally, the fact that uh, the society and the city didn't really turn it out to be like uh, Branzi was predicting does not change in millimeter the relevance of his work and the interest of his things. And the same was for Artigram and so on. So uh, I think that, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a truly a great moment uh, because there is a complete world to be reinvented. And also it's even more fun because uh, there is no uh, age uh, uh, distinction. Like in this extent, uh, rather the opposite. Probably if there is a new world to be invented, if you are 20, it's much better than to be 40 or 60. I'm finished <laughs> and uh, thank you.
one sec. Can you just let me know when you're ready for the sound? Uh, yeah. Um, when this slide comes up, we have sound. Um, when I finish this project, it's the last thing, it's just a video that goes on. Okay, now there is uh, Theo Spiropoulos. Theo is a co-director here at the DRL, at the Architectural Association, and is a founder of Minima Forms. He will present, uh, in this case, a project uh, that was commissioned by ICA and presented in Trafalgar Square here in London. Uh, he is part of the, this, uh, this mix between the people that were in universe and, the, and some people that are working on similar subjects at the EA. So he will present this work that was in London, I think, in October for three nights. Thank you. I mean, first, I just want to thank Marianne and Claudia for the invitation. We didn't actually participate in the actual exhibition itself, so part of my discussion today is actually talking, I think, in a certain capacity, on um, the notion of architecture machine and a little bit how it sort of plays a role in the work that we actually develop. Uh, Minima Forms is really a kind of joint uh, experiment, I guess, between myself and my brother. We've been working together pretty much since 2004, trying to develop work that we're trying to talk about in terms of kind of facilitating new forms of communication for architecture and design. We don't necessarily find many distinctions, and we sort of try to work in approaches that are cross-media and cross-disciplined. So in terms of the discussion today, I think it's kind of important to actually uh, recognize certain movements, and in particular has a personal history with myself, but in, in, in sort of responding to Marianne's text actually that I read in the catalog in general, the architecture machine has obviously been a kind of evolving interest. In particular, the architecture machine group started up by Negroponte in 68 was trying to look and see what the actual new tools, computation in general would actually have for the praxis and the rethinking of architecture and its discipline, and in particular to the work that we tried to develop, we're quite interested with some of the initial questions that this group was actually set up with, which was to try to come to some understanding what it means to actually cohabitate and co-evolve with tools. In the words of uh, Negroponte, anyway, he thought of it as a problem of a kind of intimate association between man and machine between the similar processes which need to be synthesized and he thought design and computation were um, in a certain sense able to sort of develop systems that are intelligent and at the same time uh, stimulate so concepts such as participation interaction intelligence and environment are some of the things or at least the spirit the sensibility that we try to discuss in my own work and in parallel, I think just of note to discuss in terms of 1968 at MIT, 
The Center for Advanced Visual Studies was also a group that was moving in parallel, in particular sort of exploring art and technology and its own implications, and someone like Grigori Kepish was actually very important and quite instrumental in our conceptions of participation and the role that art, science, and technology would actually have. He is quite famous for inviting many people to MIT, the likes of, uh, to discuss at the center, people like Norbert Wiener, people like Buckminster Fuller, and so forth, and trying to create a kind of culture of ideas rather than a sort of distinction of autonomy between architecture, art, technology, and so forth. And at the center, anyway, I just show um, a project that we've been working on for three years with a collaborator named Krzysztof Wojcicku, who has been quite influential personally um, in many capacities. But one of the issues that we've been trying to do at the center is to try to develop a kind of mobile architecture or machine as a communication device for a kind of, as a kind of cultural prosthetic. And I show it only because I think the, the notion of the architecture machine is a kind of very open and speculative question. And in regards to our own work, we are actually looking for a kind of cross-medium approach to actually explore these things. And this particular thing is a project and process that we're trying to develop to actually use a sort of vehicle as an environment in itself that could be self-contained and take on the personalities of the veterans to emerge into the public space and create a kind of threshold between their own personal experience and the community or the public in general. So I just show some images of that. I think another issue that's really important for us in particular is a notion of stimulation and uh, maybe different from some of the people that Mariandra was talking about. We do believe in a kind of more human-centric uh, interaction. We're really interested in looking at architecture as an instrument and trying to find ways in which this instrument could actually be used, abused, and stimulated. Um, so we take on an approach of using installations as a mechanism to sort of treat this as a kind of experiment that we start to evolve. We talk a little bit about this uh, in a project that was quite interesting for us because it was the inverse of actually our expectations that we started. Becoming Animal was basically an invitation to participate in an electronic music festival um, with basically people from Warp and Planet Mew, and we were given a house, basically one of, it was in a dis dysfunctional um, American Army base, and basically we were given a building called a K-9 building. The relevance is really that we tried to set up a kind of interactive environment. It's part narrative in terms of exploring that storytelling, so we, we sort of thought the idea of the Cerebus as an event. What we tried to do, and just to be brief about this one, is the fact that we tried to create this kind of behavior-based experimentation. We created an artificial triptych of heads, like the three heads of the, the Cerebus, and we wanted to actually create these heads to have animate and lifelike properties in a way to stimulate basically the interaction between the participants and so forth. And we went on this kind of project of trying to develop a system. I'll show you just very briefly what the system was based on. It was trying to basically find some form of recognition in the system that then would trigger a series of <laughs> effects. Which what we ended up doing is we wanted to have the actual head recognize people. So for example, these are some of the initial experiments. We were trying to use light proximity as a recognition device for the intensity to drive the system itself. So the dog itself would get angry. This is just one sound sample, for example. And we had to develop, I mean, what was a simple idea to drive this it started to actually become a little bit more complex when we started to realize, obviously, there's going to be more than one or two people. And obviously, movement is actually very important to actually how the head is recognizing it. So we had to develop a system that recognized multiple points and then ascribe certain behaviors as a response to that. And this here is my brother and the friend Ivan, who's getting pretty giddy because they're getting the head to actually work, and they're getting it to sort of change color, change sound levels, and so forth. And what was really interesting is that kind of pleasure and the play factor in terms of developing the work. I think that's kind of really important in terms of recognizing that there is a certain parallel between intelligence and play. So Ivan's getting a bit carried away. But what's really peculiar was actually using the experiment itself as a way of observing 
literally how you set up a project and then how people sort of actually perform with it. We use these experiments as ways to actually really start to understand how people respond, react, what's working, what's not. And we take a kind of approach where, I mean, for example, this, this woman went completely mental in front of this head when she realized that the little LED that was on her mask, we had to identify the mask as an operative element. It was a way to sort of destabilize their sort of inability to move in a conventional kind of art context and make it much more playful amongst them friends. So you see this girl, she comes in there, she's wearing the mask, she's got the little LED, it's the most flexible thing, she's moving around. She's achieved pissing it off, so it turns really red, almost crashes the system because she's getting really, really close to the camera. She goes outside, she sees her friends, kind of, they get the pat on the back, wow, that was really interesting. Now this woman goes to get the mask and does some weird kind of little head move that has absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's kind of a response of just being part of this kind of collective. So you start to see these kind of curious human behaviors that are starting to emerge. And I think the, the real interest for us was actually trying to explore literally what that meant. And in a really direct sense in terms of architecture, we were invited here in, 2000, uh, in 2004 by David Green, who is obviously quite uh, famous for his sort of contributions to Archigram, but he gave us an opportunity actually to uh, use Selfridges as a sort of platform. It was, it was thought the show itself was a kind of architectural biennale in London, and the discussion was to come up with a future vision for London. And, uh, so, and David was very generous in giving us a sort of space to operate in this. And in terms of the project, we thought about what machine actually meant and what London would be like. And it was a context of people like Foster and Zaha Hadid. And we were really not interested in the architecture itself and thought that London itself was a machine. It was a hybridizing machine. And the people that basically are filtered through this machine are really kind of important to actually understanding what London is really all about. David's only request was actually at the time we had given a talk with a collaborator of mine, Vasily Strumpakos, at P3 um, in University of Westminster. And P3 basically at that time, not the gallery that it is now, was basically where they just filled it with all the junk of the university. And David said, well, you know, we really don't have a lot of budget or anything. You are doing something at Selfridges, but it would be really great as an agenda if you could find something to do with all the stuff that they throw there, all these obsolete machines. So our response was actually to try to refigure those machines and to try to create a kind of portrait machine that would allow people to participate in a pretty straightforward way. And the notion of machine, which became very um, almost picturesque, to be honest, in the beginning, sort of taking apart these monitors and computers, then started to evolve really for us what was at the heart of the project was less about this kind of hardware in terms of the actual project. We did it twice. We did it once in Selfridges outside, uh, obviously in the storefront there. And Selfridges really didn't want us to really engage the community of Selfridges shopping. Fendi handbags is actually on the other side of our window, and they really weren't interested in us having any sort of device to actually capture people's faces. So we had to do some kind of ad hoc thing where we added people to email us portraits and so forth. When we had a second chance to do it here in 2005 in the AA, we decided that actually this whole process had to become very automatic. So we tried to really develop something from outside the box to inside the box with this creation of this kind of capture device where people could just naturally just put it up in front of themselves. It would naturally crop and take the picture and then apply it into the database. The curious function about this whole thing is right next to this capture device, there was an image of what was being captured. So people would understand how it would enter into the database and be processed by this machine. And you start to see some of the anomalies when you start to look at how people were actually responding to their own image, a kind of collective Im mirroring, if you want to call it, where you start to see some people are actually just having fun with it. Some people, certain ladies, decided they weren't happy with the first image, processed the second one. That just meant that they had two images in the database and so forth. And what we tried to do with, with all of that was try to come up with a way. We had a diagram, and this stuff is all online to sort of describe it. To the left is basically all the potential participants. When you entered into your captured face, it would start to be processed and visualized on the right-hand side. 
which was the actual displays. And as the database grew, what started to happen was also the time it took to recognize or identify your own face in it also changed. So what started at the opening of the exhibition where we had a much faster response time because the database that it was calling up was obviously much less populated. What evolved over the month was actually a very strange, curious observation pattern of really to see how people were actually responding to their own images. And this is based pretty much, we were looking at people like Chuck Close and so forth to kind of identify the three by three grid and to come up with a system where people would, always, would be able to crossbreed and create their own sort of hybridized families of so-called Londoners. Right? At the same time, we started to try to create tools that were able to recognize and possibly speculate of some of these things. Each of the images were actually tagged, and then it would call it up. And for example, we created an archive with the idea that each of the participants or anybody online could actually start to breed their own sort of families of portraiture and so forth. And the idea was that this is a kind of rolling project, that identity is very much part of this kind of composite image, which was basically the participations not only of the exhibition, but basically anybody who was interested. And the notion of participation for us is really important. And I think the, the main issue, which I'll talk a little bit about, is about this project that we were doing called Memory Cloud. And Memory Cloud is actually a project that we've been working on for about four years. We've done it in three different locations. What started out um, as a small experiment in Suffolk for a kind of electronic music community, turned then the next year into doing a version of it in Bristol where we had two remote sites, uh, one a disused cathedral and another one right outside of a media center in Bristol. And just to give you a sort of window of what we were trying to do, we were really interested in this kind of concept of animating a kind of built environment through what we were calling conversation. To sort of create an architecture or a piece of design as an instrument that allowed people to sort of communicate with each other and with the context and how with through a minimal intervention, we would be able to actually start to see a kind of collective behavior emerging. And the way that we did that is by hybridizing two kind of forms of communication. One is an ancient form, which is the smoke signal. It's 5,000 year old practice, which is visual in terms of plumes of smoke. And the second, obviously, is something that we know very well as an interface, the cell phone and mobile texting. So the ICA actually gave us an opportunity to use Trafalgar Square as a platform for that. And it started to open up a lot of issues, not just necessarily about how we would realize the peace in this public space, but necessarily all the issues around public space. And when something is actually not figured in a kind of form, all of the kind of issues of what this kind of formless and this kind of happening type of project actually um, creates. And it was a very interesting kind of discussion with the mayor of London group who was actually part of the event structuring of the project and the ICA trying to sort of calculate how much drift smoke would actually travel based on, I mean, it took a, almost a kind of ridiculous kind of definition of literally how these things would actually behave. But the reality was that we tried to do it over the three nights as a way that people could actually recognize their messages. We created a kind of collective diary that all the messages would actually be, be broadcasted the night of. So in a sense, it became this kind of yeah, a diary of the event, a kind of witness of two and a half, three hours that was there of the day. I'll just show one quick video. It's not that quick. It's 10 minutes, but I think I'm still in my time frame. Sorry, my computer's tired. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's kind of working now. I want to 
mess around too much with it because it it's not been playing nice this morning but there's sound to this one Nick basically what what we're trying to do here is just to give a little bit of a back backstory um, but we will be going over to London for now where text My messages containing greetings comments and twice. questions but anyway what you start to see is that the text becomes a piece of almost spatial typography of it's creating a space through the interaction gallery. that's actually being participated and people kind of use it in different kind of capacities. They send messages to each other and their loved ones. They send messages to people that were abroad in the conflict. But we basically process 1,500 messages over a three-day period. 94.9 FM. And the smoke is about to return to London. Don't forget, this is always known as the big smoke, because once it was the foggiest, smoggiest city in the world. Well, we BBC stopped all that now, we're all nice and clean. But not for three nights, we won't be. Because between from Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, 8th to the 10th of October, Trafalgar Square will become the big smoke again. And it's all because of the memory cloud. And for us, it was kind of really interesting just to see how people actually started people to behave with it. Some people were really interested in trying to touch the light, trying to find some way of interacting with the smoke. But it did start to stimulate people and behaviors and comments and, and I think kind of interesting ways. I mean, obviously, the, the project itself is about complete uncertainty in a sense. I mean, the driftscapes and the smoke, we try to control it in a certain capacity to start to fall into the trajectory of the projections. But at the same time, that was part of this kind of animating, writing and erasing of literally the messages that were being processed. And part of the project was also to create the kind of interface that was robust enough to get all of these multiple messages at the same time. And we developed a kind of queue process to be able to process them in a kind of printing queue almost. And It's a tried and tested technology. It works. The technology works, but it's very site specific. I mean, doing it in Trafalgar Square, I think, is very particular. The so these are some of the. I mean, we. Trafalgar Square is quite. We got really lucky with the weather, but basically everything up till the initial broadcast, the opening of the show. It's a very open I mean, the water, you know, it was raining. It was really terrible. And we had a BBC broadcast, literally like at the opening with a camera pointed at this thing like okay the weatherman wants to go on is this thing going to work or not so i mean the the nature of the actual project itself kind of opened up all kinds of curious um discussions actually about the nature of performance and nature of actually doing something which was an environment a kind of ephemeral environment that was really given form through participation and through environmental um, effects basically One of the things that we were really interested in is the fact that the, the actual text and everything and is always in a process of formation. Into so that of people are actually smoke. trying to... They are very deliberate in terms of trying to read actually what the messages are going on. We were kind of surprised the fact that we actually held an audience for usually the duration of it. I think part of it was just the fact that it was a bit of a visual spectacle. But another one was, I think, because there was this kind of playful interaction, also almost reading what was going up there in the crowd as well. And some of it actually drifted up till, you know, the, the footsteps of the National Gallery and so forth. So the scale of this actually changed as obviously the driftscape changed with, uh, with the winds, basically. And for us, it took very particular meaning because Trafalgar Square was, was always a space that's been used for a kind of collective action. It's always been a space where people could go and sort of voice their opinions. Signals. That's where May Day and a, and a lot of other things SMS are actually taking place we'll as this kind of public forum. And in this sense, I mean, we 
we sort of opened it up to allow people to actually communicate and part of the discussion was actually how much could we censor this or not censor it uh, how people are going to respond would this happening? stimulate a riot would I mean yeah, the discussions it's, it's were really crazy because I think people don't actually really understand uh, human behavior so much in the sense that I think people are always expecting things to go wrong and people to actually behave in less than appropriate ways. But I think what happened was generally most of the people were actually using it in a quite playful and productive way, just for the pleasure of it through their own sort of personal interest and motivation. Is there a reason why the display took place specifically in Trafalgar Square? Is this a place that you chose? Well, we were in discussion with the Institute of Contemporary Art about a space that we thought would be kind of appropriate for running a project. I think just to mention, I mean, after we did this exhibition, um, some kind of unfortunate news, actually, because the live and media arts uh, initiative at the ICA, which was obviously instrumental for allowing us to create this piece and a curator named Emma Quinn. Right after us, there was one other piece by Lozano Hammer. But after that, there was a decision of the ICA actually to close live and media arts because so-called new media and cross-media platforms were actually not deemed contemporary, which I think is actually a, a real shame because to be honest with you, it is also the history historically a very important period because the ICA was actually held cybernetic serendipity and it's its anniversary which was actually quite important and relevant I think in the discussion maybe today of the role that science and art actually played and not thinking of artists or scientists actually in a very different way at all but strangely enough I think the discussion has to become a kind of productive one if if opportunities like that you know not necessarily for someone like myself but just generally in the discussion you know, it, it becomes a bit curious how decisions are actually made with the institutions at hand. I'm just going to let this thing play off and then I'll be done here. Understand, uh, this one was very, very popular. Yeah, we had a lot of people coming through, and we processed about 1,500 texts. Um, it ran for two and a half hours each night, and it was over three, three minutes after. I see. All right, well, Theos Pidopoulos, thank you very much for being with us on Athens International Radio. Thank you very much for having me. And I'll say just one other thing. What was really strangely curious about the whole project is that people really just got it. They got it because it was really simple, something that they could really understand. And it was strange because, like, for example, we had a lot of interest from BBC, from Athens International Radio, from different places, because they understood the kind of real importance of communication and trying to find alternative ways to, you know, basically to express and to communicate. And somehow I think that it's kind of important to discuss the, the role that communication actually plays in some slightly sometimes unorthodox ways, but it does start to trigger a discussion around literally actually how we use space and how space actually is, could be used in a very operative way um, when we talk about the notion of what media could mean for, for architecture. Um, so there's no mirrors involved. It's not smoke and mirrors. There's no smoke and mirrors. It's, <laughs> it's smoke and light. Smoke and light coming together to form Memory Cloud at Trafalgar Square next week. That's Wednesday, the 8th to Friday, the 10th of October. Yeah, thank you very much. People are interested to see what people send through. 
there's a web link basically memorycloud.com and you could see all the messages that people actually uh, yeah basically texted during the three days stop it here actually thanks